Hi friends, I'm Gio, and today's story is a little bit longer. It's called Beep. I hope you have a good time listening to it. Right this way, please. Your party is expecting you, the hostess said, and led Mom and me to a table near a window. A table set for four, but only one man sat there. The hostess eyed my skateboard and backpack, but said nothing. She frowned at my old, wrinkly suit. I don't know what we could see out the window. It was dark outside, except for the Christmas lights decorating the buildings. But this far south, we don't get snow. It snows in Vegas about once a decade. Christmas Eve in the city known for its parties. We had gone up to the top level of one of the hotels and were dining at The Regal, a snobbish restaurant known for its amazing views of the Vegas Strip. A live band played old cover songs and Christmas songs, and two or three couples slow danced on the dance floor while some guy sang about chestnuts. Small crystal chandeliers hung above each black lacquer table, and carefully placed mirrors made the room seem bigger. The walls were a golden beige, with dark wood trim. Dimly lit, the restaurant seemed warm and intimate, if you could afford it. Three overly decorated pine trees, the tallest standing at least twelve feet tall, stood next to the dance floor. The theme was old toys and red plaid. Pine garlands draped every surface, and twinkling white lights dotted the pine garlands. Red plaid ribbons and bows hung everywhere. The tables all had crisp white tablecloths and candles, and too many polished silver forks, and gleaming plates nestled on plates. Each plate held the monogram of Regal. This was the kind of place that charged for having ice in your glass. This night had disaster written all over it. Merry freaking Christmas. I straightened my suit for the millionth time. I hadn't worn it since the first time I had appeared before a judge. Was that four years ago? When I was a stupid, scared 17-year-old kid? The suit does not fit anymore. Mom made me wear a tie even though the neck of the shirt was too small, and I can't button the top button. I'm not a suit kind of person, and I hate ties. I'm Mackenzie Hatcher. I know. It sounds like a girl's name, but tell that to my dad. He named me after some famous boxer. Dad was Irish. I'm only half Irish. Mom's Canadian. And if I hear one more joke about gold and leprechauns and rainbows, I'll break somebody's nose. I have a problem with anger, which is part of the reason I met a judge too many times. Mom turned me around and pushed the tie up as tight to my neck as she could. Don't ruin this for me. Don't strangle me, Mom. I'll act nice. She sighed and straightened out the gay pride flag pin on my lapel. Are those paint stains on your shirt and on your suit? Didn't you have another shirt? Technically, it's gray primer. You'd know I don't have fancy clothes if you ever came by my apartment. Why did your boyfriend insist we come here? I asked. You brought your skateboard here? She scoffed. Stop nagging me. I'll keep it under the table, I said as Mom pulled me deeper into snob zone. Mackenzie, Mom said, smoothing a non-existent wrinkle in her skin-tight little black dress. I really like Carlton, so act like a normal person for once, okay? You mean keep my mouth shut and smile when somebody talks to me, I said. For once, just act like everybody else, she said. Mom, I said, annoyed, stop treating me like I was seventeen. Why did Carlton want to see me anyway? It's Christmas. He wanted to meet my family. Mom said, but she avoided looking at me. Did you have to come with purple hair and contacts? You look like an alien. Are you trying to embarrass me? Just don't make a scene, okay? I'm 21. I'm a sophomore working on an art degree specializing with airbrush. My hair is normally light brown, but I haven't seen that color since middle school. I belong to the Hair Color of the Month Club. This month, eggplant purple with purple contacts. I've got three silver hoops in my right ear, none in my left, and I parkour to school every day with my stubby, my 19-inch skateboard. That's how I got here tonight. There you are, Alice. I was beginning to get worried, Carlton said, rising from his seat to kiss Mom. You look nice tonight. Is that a new perfume? It's the same perfume you gave me, but thanks for the compliment, Mom said. Carlton was a man used to wearing an impeccable suit, and a tailored one, too. 
His tie had the shimmer of something expensive. His hair was salon-styled and gold. He had really dark eyes and was tanning salon tan. He seemed younger than Mom. Did Mom like younger men, or did Carlton have plastic surgery? Carlton held the chair out so Mom could take a seat. He glanced at me, my hair, my earrings, sizing me up like a prize fighter eyeing his opponent. His eyes descended to my well-used skateboard and remained there for a second. It was just like back in juvenile detention. Guards and social workers were trying to figure out how much trouble you'd cause. Carlton's mouth downturned, then resumed a smile. You must be Mac. Your mom has told me all about you. I hope mom didn't mention anything about me, except maybe I'm gay and an art student. Carlton offered his hand, and I shook it. His grip was a little too firm, like he was in one of those 1970s macho handshaking contests. I learned a long time ago that sometimes it's better to play the wimp. They underestimate you. I made my hand limp as he squeezed and I winced. Let him think he's dominated me. Mom's boyfriend wore a custom Italian suit with a tuxedo shirt. I don't know if his diamond cufflinks were real or fake, but they sparkled. I prefer Mackenzie, I said, letting him squeeze the life out of my poor little hand. A handshake said a lot about a person. Carlton was a man who was used to being on the top in every situation. Ouch, you're strong, I said, and pulled my hand from Carlton's grip. Mom mouthed, don't be difficult. Carlton gave a slight smile and smoothly said, I prefer Mackenzie too. It sounds sophisticated. Sophisticated is one word that does not describe me. I would have rolled my eyes, but Mom wanted me to be polite. This was the man she'd been dating for the last six or eight months. I suspect she's been sleeping with him, too, because once I came by on a Saturday morning to do laundry, I let myself in and heard odd noises from the bedroom. I quietly left and did my laundry at Dad's place every week after that. Dad liked me coming over. It gave us a chance to talk. I took a seat by the window, sliding my board under the table and hanging my backpack on the chair. Mom and Carlton sat opposite. The empty place setting was next to me. Are we expecting someone? I asked. Alice, I hope you don't mind, but since we are introducing our families to each other, I asked my son Eldridge to join us, Carlton said. Mom had me when she was twenty. Carlton seems younger than Mom. I bet his kid is some zit-faced preteen that can't put down their phone and is always yapping about superstar idols like Stacy Coleman or Sterling Locke. Though Sterling Locke's boyfriend, Kobe was worth staring at. Tonight would be seriously stressful. Good thing I brought my sketchbook. Make nice, Mackenzie. I faked a smile. Mackenzie, I think you'll like the Regal. Your mom and I have come here five times, Carlton said. Six. Remember the weekend after Thanksgiving, Mom said, her cheeks slightly blushing. We dropped by and they found a table for us, and the hotel had a room as well, Carlton said and kissed Mom's hand. Then he turned to face me. The chef used to run a restaurant in Paris that had two Michelin stars. He's running the kitchens tonight. You're in for something special. Michelin makes tires, don't they? I didn't know they owned restaurants, I asked. Mom and Carlton stared at each other as if neither could believe I had said something so stupid. What had I said? Don't act dumb. Everybody knows, Mom said, a trace of a scowl on her face. Except me, I guess. I need to shut up before I screw up Mom's date. The waitress brought us menus and the wine list. I took a look at the wine list first, because I'm going to need something to get through the night. Oh my God, how can a can of beer or a glass of wine cost so much? The wine list disappeared out of my hands. What? You're not old enough for that, Carlton said, and took it from me. I'm 21. Give it back, I said. This time I locked eyes with the jerk. I stamped down the little bit of anger inside me. I don't handle anger well. Alice, you can't be old enough to have a child that old. You look too young, Carlton said, and laid the wine list on his menu. Did he just call me a child? It must be a slip. Mom flashed a brief smile, and her cheeks, already slightly red, reddened a little bit more. If I don't know better, she started to say, and gave Carlton the look. You know, 
the kind you give somebody when you want them to take you to bed? Carlton had just used me to make points with my mom. I took a breath and glared at him. This night just got longer. I hope I don't get angry. Would you pass the wine list back, please? I asked. Of course, Carlton said. He held it out for me, but held it tight so it wouldn't leave his hand. Thank you, I said, holding it and waiting for Carlton to let go. Another domination game. Any time now, I said again. We locked eyes for a second before Carlton let go. This man was a macho creep. My fake smile disappeared and I read through the list. I had to be nice, for Mom's sake. She likes Mr. Mega Butthead. Carlton's phone vibrated. Eldridge will be here in about five minutes. He says we should go ahead and order. He's already called his in and paid. I had never asked who was paying for this. Mom had not said anything and Carlton had not offered, so it is each person for themselves. Was this another domination game? The doofus would win this round. The prices on the menu were so high they gave me nosebleeds. Either I could pay for an entree or pay rent for next month. I knew this place was expensive, but not this bad. My bank account could not afford this. I did not like this restaurant. Give me a dollar burger from Gordon's Gourmet Burgers, slap on some cheese and bacon, and I'd be happy. It would probably taste better, too. I looked for the cheapest thing on the menu and prayed I didn't have to donate plasma to afford it. Our waitress came by and set a loaf of bread on the table and two small bowls. Two small pitchers joined the bowls. What's in those? I asked. Mackenzie, Mom said, smiling, but her tone dropped. I must have asked another dumb question. If Mom rolled her eyes any more, she'd be looking backwards. The waitress smiled and gave me the pre-programmed speech reserved for idiots. The lighter one contains cold-pressed extra virgin olive oil imported from Italy. The darker pitcher is a balsamic vinegar made in a monastery along the shores of the Mediterranean. The sourdough bread is from an old recipe handed down from one of the hill towns in Tuscany. Would anyone care for a cocktail? Do you mind if I order for you, darling? We like a French Blanc from 1985, Carlton said, never giving Mom a chance to answer. Carlton, that's the room number from our trip back in November, Mom said, her hand going over her mouth. We're celebrating, he said, and kissed Mom's hand. What's the cheapest thing on your menu? I asked. Mackenzie, don't be rude, Carlton said. How's that rude? I said, ma'am. A vegetarian side salad served with our house dressing, the waitress said, smiling. Is it under five dollars? I asked. Mackenzie, you're embarrassing me, Mom said. I'm sorry, the waitress said. We don't have anything here for that price or less. Then I won't have anything, I said. I'm sorry, but there is a twenty dollar per person cover charge, she said. Mackenzie, I told you we were coming here. You should have planned, Mom said. I gave her a smile and turned to the waitress. Would you lead me back to your dishwashers? Carlton wrapped an arm around my mom and grinned. I'll pay for the boy. This had turned into another domination game. No, you won't, I shouted. A little bit of the anger burst out of me before I clamped it back down. Being here bothered me more than I thought. I have a problem with getting angry, and I thought I was getting better. I hadn't had an episode for more than a year. People are staring, Mom said. Let them stare, I said. A man came over. I am the manager of the Regal Restaurant. Maybe I can help. What seems to be the problem? This man is a guest of our regular customers, and he didn't realize how expensive the prices are, so he's not ordering anything, and he can't afford the cover charge, the waitress said. I'll wash dishes if it is the only way I can get out of this dump, I said. Please keep your voice down so you don't disturb our other customers, he said. We'll excuse the cover charge this once. Please remember for the next time you come. I won't be back, I said. Don't make a scene, Mackenzie, Mom said, and looked at all the tables looking at us. Would you like to order something, the waitress said. I can't afford anything, so no, I said. I'll get the boy whatever he wants, Carlton said, and emphasized the word boy. A small smile twerked his lips. No, I said. Time to stop being the wimp. He was trying to get a salad, Mom said. No, thank you. 
But Mackenzie, Mom said. No means no. Conversation closed. I don't handle anger well. It can explode out of me, and it was building. Why don't you bring back a prime rib for the kid? Is medium well? Okay, Mackenzie, Carlton said. No, I said, and reached for my stubby board, my backpack, and started walking away. If things didn't settle down, a part of me I don't like might come out. I told you Mackenzie can get like this, Mom said. Miss, cancel the prime rib, Carlton ordered. Mackenzie, it's an important night for your mother and me. Come back and join us. Please, Mom said. For Mom's sake, I relented and sat down. It was like Mom was back in high school again, with schoolgirl eyes that only noticed Carlton. I stared out the window, trying to identify places by the lights, and rolled my stubby board a little under my feet. This was one of those high-stress occasions, just like my time before the judge, except then I was wearing handcuffs. Sorry I'm late, a man said. Eldridge, Carlton said, disengaging from my mom. Let me present the woman I've been dating, Alice Hatcher, and this is her delightful child, Mackenzie. Delightful child? I bristled, but I kept the anger in check. Carlton rose. So did my mom. I guess I was expected to as well. I took my feet off the board and stood. Eldridge wasn't a zit-faced preteen, but compared to him, I was. Eldridge sort of manfully hugged his dad, shook mom's hand, and offered his to me. I took it. Once again, a grip that was a little too strong. I went limp. Unlike his father, Eldridge relaxed his hand and held mine. Eldridge had golden hair with that stylish, wind-blown look and dark eyes like his dad. He wore a tailored, expensive-looking jacket and slacks that must have cost a month's paycheck. His shoes gleamed, a mixture of dark and light leather. I bet those are Italian and are worth more than I've spent on tuition in a year. His eyes glanced at my eggplant hair and my purple eyes and my earrings. I wish I wore my beanie. I don't belong here. His flawless skin was as tan as his dad's, and he must be at least two inches taller than me. He filled out his suit like he had his own personal trainer. And even more intimidating, Eldridge looked like he had stepped away from a photo shoot for a magazine cover. Mom had struck gold with this family. I'd never fit in with this crowd. Did I miss anything? Eldridge asked. We were ordering food and had some questions about the menu. Nothing you need to worry about, Carlton said, eyeing me. We all took our seats and I took a sip of water, while Carlton poured white wine for him and my mom. Eldridge had something dark red with expensive-looking bubbles. Dad, did you see the latest financials? I told you that stock would jump, Eldridge said. I should have listened to you, Carlton said. Alice, did I tell you that Eldridge is starting his own brokerage? You must be very proud, Mom said. It's too soon to brag, Dad, Eldridge said. Okay. Do I feel small yet? What do you do, Mackenzie? Carlton asked, eyes slightly narrowing. Why did I feel like a mouse about to be eaten by a cobra? Did he already know the answer? I'm one of the lunch shift workers at the student services building, I said, my shoulders getting tenser and tenser. Yep, I feel small. That must be interesting, Carlton said with a smug edge to his voice. There was an odd glance between Carlton, my mom, and Eldridge. Mom took a sip of their Blanc 1985, then looked away from me. My little life embarrassed her. I feel very small, microscopically small. They spoke about cars, not Chevrolets or Fords, but Lamborghinis and Maseratis and Alfa Romeos. What kind of car do you drive? Carlton asked me. How much had Mom told him about me? I don't own a car, I said. A pity. How do you get around? Carlton asked. I take the bus and then skateboard the rest of the way, I said, and sunk into my chair. Sometimes the only way to survive detention was to make yourself as small a target as possible. Let the guys fight it out while you slink around them. What do you do? Eldridge asked. I paint. I custom airbrush my board and helmet. Do you want to see? I asked. Perhaps we could save that for later, Mom said. Carlton, what about that team you were following? The Brazilian one. And the conversation continued, about sports, not football or baseball. I knew about them, but tennis and badminton and water polo 
and specialized pay-per-view soccer world tournament events. What sports do you play? Carlton asked. I'm sorry, but between my job and classes I don't have time, I said. But I'm good with a frisbee. Sometimes me and the guys throw it across the commons outside the student services building. I've customized mine. Would you like to see? I turned and pulled my backpack from the chair and pushed the plates and too many forks to the side to make room. You'd think I had just spoken Mandarin Chinese with the look that came across their faces. I guess frisbee was not part of the rich vocabulary. Mom shook her head no and said, This probably isn't an appropriate place. Another time. I left the frisbee in my backpack. I was embarrassing, Mom. I pulled out my sketchbook and drew rough drafts for the mural I was working on while Mom, Carlton, and Eldridge spoke about whatever. Once again, I didn't fit in. Then their food arrived. Carlton had little circles of meat with the bones sticking out, wrapped with something edible and see-through on a bed of bright green asparagus. Mom had ribs with hats on them that formed a tower on her plate and a bowl of odd mint green sauce. Eldridge had something I guess was fish on a bed of the strangest looking rice I had ever seen and drizzled with gold next to the weirdest baby green beans in existence. Those can't possibly be real. The waitress gave me a sad smile and a glass of water. Where's your dinner? Eldridge asked. I'm not hungry, I said. Mom rolled her eyes. Mackenzie is being difficult again. That's right. I'm being difficult. Maybe it's because you expect me to pay for dinner by becoming homeless, I said, getting out of my seat. I'm going out to the deck to get some air. I can call the waitress back over, Carlton asked. Do we have to do this again, I said, and walked away. Something about Carlton bothered me, and I couldn't say why. The anger simmered inside me, stable for the moment. Why had they invited me to here, of all places? I don't fit in. Instead, I went out to the balcony and stared at the Vegas Strip. More lights than the sky, a couple of sirens, and lots of noisy cars. At least it was kind of quiet. I have problems with anger. They call it IED, Intermittent Explosive Disorder. The anger builds inside me and I explode. Sometimes it can happen fast, other times it builds slowly. I explode and the surge of emotion leaves me drained and exhausted and depressed for as much as a week after. I have controlled it these past four years with meditation, anti-anxiety medication, and painting. But it is my worst fear that I'll get really mad around somebody I like and push them out of my life. Growing up, everybody thought I was throwing temper tantrums and got angry a lot, but it wasn't until I was in detention that the social worker diagnosed me. Mom brushed it off and never took the time to understand. It didn't matter how much trouble I got in, she gave up on me. Dad helped me get to some kind of normal. A man leaned on the railing. I supposed it was the manager. This place irritated me. Don't tell me. It cost a look at the skyline. This is a pretty lousy restaurant. You'd have more customers if you weren't so snobby. A chuckle. Dad getting to you? I looked over at the flawless blonde man who I had sat next to a little while ago. Eldridge, what are you doing out here? I asked. Same as you, taking in the view, he said. What are our parents doing? They went dancing, Eldridge said. Do you think they'll get married? My mom and your dad? They seem pretty serious, I said. That would make things awkward, Eldridge said. How so? I said. Well, for one thing, it will be dad's third wife, Eldridge said. That would make Alice the step-step mom. It would make us step-step brothers, I said. Eldridge gave me a small half smile. I think we're too old for that. I hope dad can make it work so he can stop picking on me. Mom likes him, I said. But you don't, Eldridge said. I said, as long as they leave me alone, I don't care. Eldridge shifted to look at me. What's bothering you, he said. What do I tell him? The truth? A clever lie? Just stay quiet? How could I say the truth, diplomatically? I'm nowhere close to your social level, and never will be. But your mom? he asked. When Grandpa died, she got a big inheritance and divorced my dad. She's on your level, I said. Eldridge nodded a couple of times. You make a sound stuck up. A little hint of anger pushed itself into my consciousness. I ignored the jibe to keep being friendly, but the anger inside me grew. How much did you spend on dinner? 
I don't have the finances to keep up with any of you. I think I understand. We're at the finest restaurant in Vegas. It's too expensive. You don't know anybody. You can't eat. You can't drink. Our parents ignore you or treat you like a child. You don't fit in, Eldridge said. Bingo, I said. I'd leave, but Mom and Carlton want me here for some reason. Can I ask you something, Eldridge said. Might as well, I said. Eldridge pulled out his phone, shifted a couple of screens, and showed me a mural with a bunch of people in front of it with green hair. The mural was a collection of slot machines, casino chips, and raining $100 bills. Are you the Mackenzie Hatcher who painted this? It wasn't just me, but a group of us from college. Nobody wanted to talk to a reporter, so I accidentally became spokesperson. The old soup kitchen and pantry was gra graffitied pretty bad. Usually the graffiti artists don't touch murals, so we spent a weekend and painted it. Did you get paid? he asked. The people who run the soup kitchen don't. It's all volunteer work, so why should we? I said. What about this one? He showed me a mural of bright, happy children, with the five bald artists standing in front of it, and a bald little girl. That's the sad one, I said. A friend had a little girl who had cancer. Sweetest thing you ever knew. She always kept smiling, even though she lost her hair and was sick a lot. Her name was Marisol. I had to pause because even now it made me tear up. She loved to sing. We went into the hospital to try and cheer her up, and that's when I got the idea to do the painting. We got special permission from the administrators for the mural, and they helped pay for the paint. The news cameras came in, and we had our two minutes of fame. Because I was the spokesperson of the other mural, the news crew assumed I was the spokesperson again. Nobody else wanted the job anyway. We shaved our heads to show Marisol we were there for her. The little girl standing next to us? That's Marisol. If you look at the mural, she's the third kid from the left. Everybody's smiling. Why is it sad? Eldridge asked. She passed away about a week later, I quietly said. Marisol loved the painting, said it made her look like an angel. It's still in the hospital. Ten feet tall, twenty feet wide. My friends go by every week to place a rose before a picture. I heard back that when the story about her death hit the news feeds, there were a lot of donations. You didn't get paid for that one either, he asked. I did it to cheer up Marisol, I said. We were quiet for a couple of minutes after that. Eldridge put his phone away and tapped the railing a couple of times and leaned on it with me. Any new murals? Eldridge asked. We're painting the side of the St. Horace Food Bank and Soup Kitchen tomorrow. They are letting you do that on Christmas? Eldridge said. Letting us? They are helping us and feeding us, I said. That's where I was earlier today. We primed the wall this afternoon so it can dry overnight. The regal is definitely not you. You're not enjoying yourself, are you? Eldridge said. That obvious, I said. Let me tell you a secret, Eldridge said. I don't like this place either, and I'm not having fun. Let's change that on the dance floor. You any good? I asked. With the right partner, Eldridge said. By the way, the only person who calls me Eldridge is my dad. My friend calls me Dredge, or the Dredger. Dredger? I asked. It's an old nickname from school, he said. Come on. Dredge took my hand and pulled me after him. We walked over to the dance floor and began to dance. The music was an older mom and pop style. Great for slow dancing, maybe, but Dredge and I wanted something with a beat. Dredge went up to the band. Could you play something with some life in it? Preferably an extended mix and not Christmas songs, I said. Donna Summers, heaven knows, the keyboardist said. You ever heard of the Bee Gees? You should be dancing, the guitarist said. The management prefers older, milder songs. If you can be flexible, we've got you covered, the lead singer said. Back in detention, I made some friends who could really dance. They taught me some moves. It wasn't long before I tossed the suit coat and tie, and I cut loose to classic disco. At least it wasn't ballroom dancing crap. I danced like I was on the streets. The rhythm was weird, but I could work with it. So could Dredge. We became the couple on the dance floor, gyrating and swinging and cutting loose. He took my hands and took control. He spun me around in a classic dance style. Another couple, a man and woman our age, joined the floor next to us and gave us the nod. It was on. A dance-off to disco. The band was great, the rhythm contagious. 
The other couple spent 30 seconds showing us their moves. Then we copied them. Dredge had the looks and the moves. Christmas Eve was getting better. We showed them our fancy footwork. They copied. Their turn. The man stood still, his arms folded, his toe tapping, while the woman did some wild move around him and ended it with a kiss. A French kiss. You stand in the middle, Dredge said, and danced around me. Would he kiss me? We'd barely met. He leaned me back, stared in my eyes, and kissed me. His mouth was hot and fun, and his tongue was playful. Somewhere in that kiss, we both giggled. What a first kiss. Wow. You don't know what you just started, I said, and kissed him back. It's not my fault, Dredge said and laughed. I was only copying the dance move. I looked at the other couple and said, copy this. I French kissed Dredge, then took control. Don't move. Carlton walked around the edge of the dance floor and talked to the same guy who had come to our table earlier. I learned a lot back in detention. We had dance-off, guys showing off moves. We had competitions. Nothing gay. Just a group of really bored guys in lots of trouble and watched 24-7. All day long, we worked out and danced. Street dancing, street moves, none of this prissy stuff. I timed it with the disco beat and let loose. I ended with a flip and landed into half splits. I folded my arms and nodded. The guy nodded back. He whispered something to the girl, and then he kissed her like I kissed Dredge, and copied me, move for move, including the flip and half splits. Not bad. My turn, Dredge said. The man Carlton had talked to went to the band. No, no, no. Ladies first, the woman said, with a seductive smile for her partner. Dredge gave her a small bow, and we surrendered the floor to them. She was halfway through some move when the music slowed to something very different. A very boring rendition of Silent Night. No beat, no life. Even disco was better than this. The four of us looked at the band. The keyboardist mouthed, sorry, and tilted his head to the man Carlton had talked to. Just when we were having fun, I said. We went over and chatted with the other couple. We'll call it a tie, the other guy said, but we would have won. In your dreams, Dredge said. Who is that guy that killed the music? The guy in charge of this rahul, the girl said. They say the food's supposed to be good here, but there's no flavor, no heat. It's like eating plain mashed potatoes. Somebody had a little too much fun, the guy said, and pointed at my shirt. My old shirt had lost a couple of buttons. It was spread open halfway to my navel. But dancing with Dredge was worth it. I wasn't the only one who was not completely dressed. Dredge has lost his tie somewhere. He unbuttoned his shirt to match mine, and then we kissed. The music was only slow and slow Christmas songs after that. But I wouldn't let the fun end. I pulled my phone out and my wireless earbuds and found a playlist of dance songs. I handed one of the earbuds to Dredge. The music sucks here. Good thing I brought my own. With the earbuds in, we had modern music and we could seriously dance. It didn't matter what the band played. We danced to our own music. We found ourselves in the center of the floor eyes only on each other, and danced and held each other and laughed. We talked sometimes, but I liked it best when Dredge wrapped his arms around me. I felt safe with him. He didn't seem to mind when I laid my head on his shoulder. The warmth of his body felt good, and I closed my eyes and enjoyed. The anger inside me disappeared, and for the first time that night, I relaxed. I know I'm hard to be with, and I'm sorry, I whispered. Mackenzie Hatcher... I'm not. Our mouths found each other again. It was barely even a date, but I couldn't get enough of him. I love your hair and your eyes and the way you dance, the way you care about people. I want to see your murals. Take me some time, Dredd said. You talk like I'm something special, but I'm not. It's just a paintbrush. It's just hair dye and contacts, I whispered. I could stare at your eyes all night long. What's the real color? 
he asked. Boring Brown, I said. His warmth, his breath, excited me. Not boring, beautiful, Dredge said. I want to see you again. His nearness was like a drug. We leaned in. I don't know who started it, but our lips brushed together. Again. Sorry, I whispered. Do you see me complaining? How about some wine? Dredge whispered. I pulled away, folding my arms. Even after I had told him about my finances, didn't Dredge realize I couldn't afford anything at this place? I'm sorry, I said. Talk to me. Don't pull away, he said, pulling me close, his arms around me, and we slow danced. I can't live in your world. It's too much. I don't know anything about it. I don't know how to act. I can't afford anything, and I'm not going to beg. I pay my own way. I'm only a simple artist who lives a simple life, I said. Then I guess we have to find things we both can do. Dancing is free, Dredge said, and we swayed a little. I can afford that, I said, and held him. Talking is free, he whispered. This entire night, my dad and your mom and me have talked about us. I want to hear about Mackenzie Hatcher, the man with the purple hair and the purple eyes and who knows how to dance and paints pictures with meaning behind them. There's not much to tell, I said, but I definitely wouldn't tell him about my time before the judge or the, all those months I was stuck in detention and especially my anger problems, at least not tonight. I didn't want to spoil the magic. An artist, a student, a man who creates, a man whose art makes people happy. That sounds like a very interesting man, Dredd said. Why did you choose art? It sounds like you're trying to seduce me, I said, but with a smile. Would I do that on the first date, Dredge said. He leaned in and whispered, Why art? I stopped smiling and stared past him. I would not tell Dredge about my mistakes tonight. If we had a second date, I'll tell him then. It's my way of dealing with life, I said. We talked and danced and talked, never leaving the dance floor. We held each other for several minutes as we talked. I couldn't get enough of him. Dredge made me feel like somebody was interested in me. I already know I'm pathetic. I have problems. But for these few minutes, it didn't matter. Somewhere in that conversation, the song changed to something slower, romantic, and we held each other, our lips closing again, connecting. In the middle of the dance floor, we kissed. Dredge's mouth was hot. His breath tickled. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun, but we need to take a break, the lead singer said. See you in 15. We smiled, but with the earbuds still playing music, we could keep dancing, even if the band wasn't playing anymore. We were the only couple on the dance floor, and we kissed like we were alone. Eventually, Dredge gave me the earbud back, took my hand, and led me back to our table. I'd like to continue our conversation but not here. Phone numbers are free. If it's okay, can I call you and maybe have a real date? Dredge said. I bet you have lots of boyfriends or girlfriends, or both, I said. You can have anyone you want. I'm a one relationship at a time kind of guy, Dredge said. I stay with him until it doesn't work anymore, or we stay together for the rest of our lives. You don't do one night stands? I asked. I tried it once, but it was very uncomfortable. I need to get to know a guy before we become intimate, Dredge said. I'd like a chance to get to know you and see how far it goes. Even if it only lasts a month or two, I asked. Then we better hurry, he whispered and kissed my hand. I wanted to see Dredge again, but I didn't want him to know about my mistakes or my anger issues. Not yet. I'd tell him someplace quieter when we could be alone. Let's set a couple of rules, I said. If I can't afford it, we don't do it. I'm not going to leech off you and your money. Okay, Dredge said. I like that. Somebody who won't let me pay for everything. That's kind of refreshing. Next rule? Let's try not to double date with our parents again. That feels all kinds of wrong, I said. Dredge chuckled as he led me back to the table. Easily agreed to. Anything else? My mom stomped over. Mackenzie, did you enjoy making a spectacle of yourself? I told you not to embarrass me, and look at you. The Regal has a dress code, Mom said, her voice brittle and shrill. 
Carlton helped Mom take a seat. What was that out there on the dance floor? You can't keep time with the music, and even when there is none, you're shaking like idiots. We were dancing, I said. That wasn't dancing. And all of your kissing? Didn't you hear people whispering about it? Mom said. So? A lot of people kiss and dance, Dredge said. Eldridge, I'll deal with you later, but for now be quiet. Mackenzie, you and your friends made sure no one else could dance, Carlton said. We were only having fun, I said. Your mom has told me about some other times you had fun. Say, four years ago, Carlton said. Mom took a sip of wine and avoided looking at me. Your exhibition on the dance floor only proved what I suspected. You are a wild, uncontrolled little boy who never grew up and throws tantrums. Your mother told me about your petty anger issues. That's why we're here. You won't dare get angry in a place like this, and we are going to talk about your life, Carlton said. What do you mean, Dad? Dredge said. Somehow, I knew what was coming. I looked at Dredge, hoping that little bit of peace we had shared wasn't over. I think it was. I have to stay in control. I had to keep the anger locked inside. Please, God, don't let that part of me out. Don't let Dredge see it. Did Mackenzie tell you he has a police record? Shoplifting, petty theft, assault that ended in a broken nose, auto theft, and several months in detention. He didn't graduate high school. He had a social worker he had to report to weekly to talk about his infantile tantrums. Am I leaving anything out? I looked at Dredge, trying to read his face. No emotion, no twitch, only a hard stare at me. Oh no. Does he hate me? I don't fit in with his family. I don't fit in with mine. No matter how hard I try, I don't fit in. Answer me, Carlton yelled. You're nothing but... Carlton, you are a jerk. Let me clarify, I shouted. The anger suddenly burst out of me. Seventeen counts shoplifting... Seven counts underage drinking, ten counts possession of alcohol, four counts petty theft, multiple counts trespassing, several minor fights with no chargers, two larger ones. The last one I was charged with aggravated assault. I got mad and broke the nose of the guy I was fighting. When the police showed up, I stole a car and fled the scene. It only took the police thirty minutes to catch me, and the judge sentenced me to a long, long time in juvenile detention. So long, I would have missed graduating if I wasn't already failing everything. Carlton snickered. Mom gave a faint smile. Dredge inhaled sharply, his eyes never leaving mine. Whatever chance we had was over. I had to earn my GED so I could go to college. I turned 18 that September and the court sealed my records. The judge said that as long as I don't get into any trouble, things will be fine. But if he ever saw me again, he won't be nice, and mentioned something about dropping the key in the middle of the desert, personally. I haven't had any trouble with the law since. When I get mad, I need someone to talk to. When I turned 18, I lost the social worker I was working with. I had to find someone else. He's not court mandated, but helps me talk through things. Dredge didn't move. I wasn't the kind, compassionate artist he must have thought I was. There are certain standards that people in my position must meet, Carlton said. I like to find out what I'm dealing with, preferably before we announce our engagement. I felt violated. I felt sick. The little worm of anger swirled in my gut, ready to leap out again. That's right. Carlton and I are getting married, Mom said, smiling and wiping an eye. Carlton set a diamond engagement ring on the table. That's one reason I wanted Eldridge here, because I want him to share in our happiness. The other reason? So you can see what I expect from a son. No more purple hair, or purple contacts, or earrings. Look at the way you dress. You've shamed your mom, and since I'm going to be your stepfather, you've shamed me. I chilled. The anger was building again. The way my stomach nodded, it was going to be a bad episode. My mom took another sip of her wine, looked at the ring, looked at me, then quickly glanced at Carlton. Mackenzie needs a strong hand. You'll be a great stepfather. I clenched my hands. I had to stay calm. We will talk about that in a minute, Alice. Mackenzie, you're a convicted thief with a temper who has screwed up my Alice's life, Carlton said. Do you expect that once I marry your mom, I will come and bail you out when you get in trouble? Because I won't. You will not get in trouble, even if I have to hire someone to keep you out of trouble. This man infuriated me. I clenched my hand around the tablecloth and the anger spread. I clenched my fist tighter. It didn't do any good. The anger exploded out of me like fireworks. I spoke low and mean, but the volume increased until I shouted. 
Mom hasn't done anything for me either, so what's the difference? Now you know what kind of a loser I am. It was time to stop playing the wimp. Mackenzie, quiet. Mom said softly, shut up. I screamed. You're just a punk that needs a strong hand, Carlton said. Young man, there will be some changes once I marry your... Shut up, I screamed. I want to punch that domineering nose off your face. It's time to show you how weak you are. Mackenzie, Mom yelled, shut up. If you had even tried to be a mother, I could have gotten help years sooner, I yelled. Be quiet, Carlton yelled. You act like you are the president or the pope. But you are nothing but a spoiled, rich, egotistical, sociopathic control freak, I yelled, standing. I've made my own way since I've gotten out of detention. Mom didn't help me. She was too busy being popular with high-class snobs and sleeping with everybody, like you. I've done it all. I got my GED. I put myself through college. I'm an artist. And I'm 21. You can't control me. When will you learn that you have to earn my respect? And you're doing a pretty damn poor job of it. Mackenzie, sit, Carlton started to say. If you try to control me, you better be able to fight me and win because I will break your freaking nose, I yelled. I walked around the table until I was next to him. I put my foot at the bottom of his chair and held it there. Carlton tried to stand, but I refused to let his chair move. You can keep your stupid money and wipe your butt with it, I yelled. Mackenzie, honey, don't make a... Mom tried to say, smiling to all the tables around us. Any moment now and I'd have steam coming out of my ears... Mom, I've had enough of your stupid rich world. I've had enough of this piece of crap you call a boyfriend. If you can't do better than this dog turd, then shut up, she yelled. As my social worker had said when I got out of detention, my choices had screwed my life. But it was still my life, not Carlton's. How dare you talk, Carlton shouted. The anger flashed out again and I yelled, Carlton, you started this fight. I'll end it. You think you are some big shot, but you are nothing but a wannabe. You wouldn't last five minutes on the streets or in detention. Your money makes you stuck up and stupid. You expect your money to get you respect? It doesn't. You haven't done anything to earn anybody's respect. And tonight, you didn't earn mine. Maybe when you do, I'll consider talking to you. You have no right, Carlton started to say. Who's the little boy now, Carlton? Who's the child? Who's really in control? Definitely not a wimp like you, I yelled. You have no say in my life. Stay out of it. The restaurant was dead quiet. Every table stared at me. Carlton's mouth turned grim. Mom's hand fluttered about her mouth. Dredge sat there staring at me. The manager paused and then walked this way. Look at you. Nothing more than a rude freak. Your behavior is not acceptable. Apologize to both me and your... Carlton said. I can't believe how pathetic you are. You're acting like a little boy who had his toy broken. Grow up, Carlton. The guys in detention would steal everything you own and beat you up until you called for your mommy, I said. Dredge still hadn't moved. He was so beautiful. Maybe we could have had something. But it was time to say goodbye. Dredge, I told you I didn't belong here. I don't belong anywhere. And I definitely don't belong with this entitled, stuck-up snob you call a dad. How did you manage to turn out so nice with such a horrible person for a father? I said. I grabbed my board and backpack. It was nice dancing with you and kissing you, Dredge. You're not bad. It would be nice to dance with you again sometime, but we both know your snobby daddy won't allow it. Look at Carlton. Is he getting ready to cry yet? Mackenzie, Mom yelled. Don't invite me to your wedding. If either of you finally do something to earn my respect, call me, I said. Otherwise, you two children can play make-believe in Carlton's backyard or Mom's bed. Merry Christmas, losers. Dredge had barely moved, and he wasn't staring at me anymore. He'd seen the real me, the part I kept locked away. As I walked out, I passed our manager. A lot of anger was still leaking out of me. I wanted to hit something, but I forced myself calm. I yelled at him. Don't worry, I'm leaving. Send the chef back to his tire factory, because he can't even cook mashed potatoes. Somewhere behind me, a woman shouted, You tell him, dance man. A chair fell backwards behind me. Mackenzie, wait, Dredge yelled. Dad, right now I don't want to be... What had I done? I hadn't gotten angry like that for a year. I had to get out of here before they called the police. I only had one person I could talk to, and I needed to talk to him fast. I didn't understand Mom and the way she fawned over Carlton. I didn't understand why Carlton felt he had to lord it over everybody. I couldn't understand how anybody could be as beautiful as Eldridge. I wanted to hit something. I wanted to break something. I wanted to scream about how unfair life was. But I had been taught better. I had been shown another way. And I had just blown it.
The elevator couldn't get to ground floor fast enough, and I hopped on my stubby board and got out of there. I rode fast. The anger had gone, and I wanted to curl up in some alley and cry. Oh, crap. The after effects of an IED episode were already starting. I needed help. Fast. I called the only person who's been helping me since I got out of detention. Mackenzie, you're calling at this hour on Christmas Eve? Are you all right? He said. No, I really blew up, I said. Where's your sketchbook, he said. I left it on the table with Mom and the jerk she's dating, I said. I've got to hear this story. Never mind about the sketchbook. I'll get you another one. How soon can you get to Gordon's Gourmet Burgers? I'm hungry. I don't have any money. Payday's not for another week, I said. That means you're buying next time. Thirty minutes, all right? I'm sorry about this, but I need to talk to somebody, I said. That's why I'm your dad, he said. I rode hard and fast, and instead of being angry, for the first time, something really sad snuck in. My hands were already starting to shake. This was going to be bad. Because of all my mistakes, I didn't belong anywhere. I didn't deserve to be with nice people like Dredge or the dancers. I hope Mom and Carlton got married and left me alone. I'm only an embarrassment. I took shortcuts cars couldn't take. I rode through alleys filled with trash, hopped stairs, vaulted over short walls, rode down railings to get from one level to another, and dashed through parks. I was mad. I was sad. The entire night replayed itself, no matter how fast I rode. The anger had come out. And Dredge had seen it. I couldn't escape the pain, the sadness. It hurt. I arrived at Gordon's Gourmet Burgers in 20 minutes, hot and sweaty, and I had no money. I sat on an outside table waiting for Dad. Maybe that's why we always sat here. Because if I got angry, it didn't matter. I had destroyed my life four years ago. No matter what I did, I kept destroying it. Why did I even try? I tried breathing techniques Dad had taught me, trying to still my emotions. I repeated my mantra, but the sadness remained. I didn't belong. Anywhere. Ten minutes later, Dad's car pulled up. He'd gone through the late night drive through and just like the many, many times we had talked before, he bought me a burger with bacon and cheese. He always bought french fries. Tons of french fries. Bad night, Dad said. We went to this horrible restaurant. I met a really nice guy, and his dad knew all about the things I did four years ago, I said. I couldn't stop wiping my eyes. I failed, Dad. I couldn't control it. I'm never going to be free of this. Tell me what happened, Dad said, and slid over a new sketchbook and mechanical pencil. While you're at it, draw for me the last thing you drew in your book. The street lamps lit the table so I could draw and eat french fries. We'd been talking for ten minutes when Dad said, I understand the problem. You met this guy, Dredge. Handsome and fun to talk to and fun to dance with and fun to kiss, right? I nodded. He saw the ugliness in me. There was no way you could impress him. Couldn't dress like him. Couldn't act like him. Couldn't be as rich as him. No matter what you did, you couldn't compare. He had the perfect life, the perfect hair, perfect teeth. Then you got the cross-examination from his jerk of a dad. And you got frustrated and angry because it reminded you of your mistakes. You're still ashamed of yourself. You don't love yourself. Haven't for years, and that breaks my heart. You've turned into an incredibly creative and talented man. I know it took a lot of work to climb out of the hole you were in, and I'm proud of you. There's nothing inside me to love, I said as another tear fell. You had a bad night, I get it, and even if your mom and Carlton get married, you don't have to see them very often. But you'd like to see this dredge guy more often. From what you described, he must be the perfect ideal of a man. You want to take him dancing. You want to kiss him. Admit it. You want to do more than just kiss him, Dad said. I had to smile at that. That's better. You seriously like him. And part of the problem tonight is you think you can't live up to his standard. Let me rephrase that. All their money and fancy clothes can't match your standards. They spend thousands of dollars to try and get what you have naturally, Dad said. It hurt and I got angry and I got sad and that made me angrier. I tried to hold back but I couldn't stop myself. I sniffed staring at the half-finished drawing before me. A teardrop had landed on it. What you're feeling is normal IED, remember? The anger ends and the guilt and remorse and the feel-bads kick in, Dad said. You have to remember, I think you're perfect. So did Marisol and her family. Remember her funeral? You got so frustrated and angry, but they understood and hugged you until you calmed down. That was the last time I got angry. I thought I was over it, I said. Dad held me as I shuddered until I calmed down. You're staying with me tonight. We had an early breakfast Christmas morning, but I only ate a little bit. 
Dad came with me to help paint St. Horace's food bank and soup kitchen. Because Dad drove, we got there early. The volunteers at St. Horace's had arrived early as well to prepare a Christmas feast for several hundred people. My friends, the other painters, were there. We all had eggplant hair and purple contacts and we wore pink t-shirts, Marisol's favorite color. A news van had shown up and they were getting ready to do a piece about St. Horace's food bank and the mural. Nobody listened to me when I said I didn't want to be spokesperson, so in spite of the way I was feeling, I had to pretend nothing bothered me. The primer had dried and we sketched out a rough outline of what went where. It took a few minutes for me to get my airbrush set up, then Dad and I painted next to each other so we could talk. I was still shaking after last night's episode, and would for days. I bet it must have been funny to see Alice's and Carlton's faces, Dad said. I stopped painting and endured the pain inside me. I failed, Dad. The anger took control. The aftermath of an IED episode is exhausting and draining, and I'll be depressed for a week. Dad handed me a napkin, and I used it to wipe my face. Last night had gotten to me more than I thought. Dad placed an arm around my shoulders. You are my perfect son, and I think I know how to solve the problem. Let's send it away. How? I asked. Let's say you had one minute to leave Dredge a voice message, and you could tell him anything you want. What would you say? Time to get the emotion out of your system. Would you swear at him? Would you tell him you love him? Whatever. But you've only got one minute. Beep. I held up my hand as if it were a phone and talked to it. Merry Christmas, Dredge. It's me, Mackenzie Hatcher. We met at the worst restaurant in Vegas. Everything your dad said about me was true, but it happened years ago. I'm not that person anymore. I know I'll never see you again, but I wanted to say I had a good time dancing with you and kissing you. I'm sorry if I embarrassed you. I didn't mean to. I'm sorry I got mad. I'm sorry I'll never be as rich as you. I guess I'm kind of plain and boring compared to you. No, you're not, Dad said. Dad, I'm on the phone, I said, and we both laughed. Dredge, I know sometimes I can be hard to be with, but I'd like to see you again. I have some pictures going up in the Student Center Gallery at the University. Opening night, we're having a reception. All the artists will be there, even me. I'd love if you could come, but I'll understand if you don't want to. And beep. Time's up. You're smiling again, Dad said. Just remember, I am really proud of you. You've had a lot to overcome. Beep. Merry Christmas back at you, a voice said in back of us. Both Dad and I looked over. Dredge stood there, holding a bucket, some paintbrushes, and my sketchbook with my pride pin sticking in the cover. He held his hand up like a phone. Mackenzie, I got your message. I think you're the first person to stand up to Dad in a long time. He's still in shock. I'll give you the details later. Anyway, I think an art opening sounds fun, and we can go dancing afterwards. I understand now why you paint those murals. You're trying to be a good person in spite of your past. I think you're a good person anyway, and who cares about four years ago? I want you to show me your murals. I want to see your paintings, and I'd like to hear a lot more about the artist named Mackenzie Hatcher. Maybe over pizza when we're done here? I know a place that is open tonight. Do you want to go? Call me back. Beep. Beep, Dad said. Mackenzie, this is Dad. I'll find my own way home tonight. Go kiss Dredge and say yes. Beep. I walked over and Dredge held me like we were slow dancing. I laid my head on his shoulder and I felt safe. Thank you everybody for listening. I know this was a very long story, but I hope you enjoyed it. And if you don't mind, leave a comment below. Would you like more stories, more longer stories, or should I keep them shorter, or does it even matter? I'd like your opinion on it. Thanks, everybody. Peace.